Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jen Sheridan, the curator of Amphibians and Reptiles at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. And today we're going to be talking with Matt LaMana, the pa vertebrate paleontology curator. Is that your official title? Something like that, yeah. Okay. Um, so we're trying out this new um, curators interviewing curators or science staff interviewing science staff. And um, I'm going to ask Matt a few questions and we're just going to have a, a conversation. So. First of all, Matt, um, I would love to know what you've been working on the last couple of weeks uh, since we've been working from home. Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm very fortunate in that I can do a lot of my research from home. Uh, and I've been in particular trying to finish up a couple of um, scientific papers, uh, drafts of scientific papers about a group of dinosaurs called Megaraptorids. Um, mm -hmm. And this is a group um, that was uh, pretty common in the Southern Hemisphere continents in the Cretaceous period, the third and final period of the age of dinosaurs. Uh, they were the kind of top predators in a lot of their environments, um, or at least we think they were. Uh, but one thing that's really cool about Megaraptorids is we don't know a whole lot about them because their fossil record is pretty poor. So every time we have a new specimen of this group, uh, it has the potential to tell us something we didn't know before about their, say, uh, uh, their evolutionary relationships, um, their um, kind of what they tell us about the shape of the world at that time. In other words, could dinosaurs migrate from place X to place Y, um, something like that. Even things as fundamental as what they look like, we actually don't know um, uh, even you know what certain parts of the skeleton of these dinosaurs really looked like. So um, so it's been really really fun and exciting to um, to work on those. I'll, um, I have actually a couple of replica fossils um, here at home of Megaraptorids, and so I'll show off one. So while you're getting that, I have a question. So is it um, as their name would sort of imply to me as a non paleontologist? Are they raptors that are very large? Um, well, so it's a it's an it's a really funny story, and it sort of tells you about how um, how paleontology goes sometimes. So, uh, when the first one of these things was found back in 1998. It was known from only four bones, um, and the scientists that named it didn't really know what it was, as you can, you know, imagine with just, I mean, think about like, you know, you, you know, you study frogs, you have the whole organism, you have its, you know, its behavior, its calls, its, you know, its soft tissue anatomy. Yeah. In, the best, in the best case scenario, we paleontologists are dealing with maybe a whole skeleton and like a little bit of soft tissue like skin or feathers or something like that and in yeah. most cases we're dealing with tiny 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 bits of skeleton so you know so as you can imagine uh, what we do is sort of fraught with uncertainty a lot of the time um, it's mm -hmm. it's one of the most frustrating things about vertebrate paleontology but also one of the most fun um, <laughs> because we we get to be in some sense artists in addition to scientists um, yes but, that kind of leads me to another thing, and I'm sorry to like interrupt you and we can come back, but this is really interesting to me because one of the things I was thinking about is I have this idea that in, ver in paleontology, at least vertebral paleontology, kind of like you just said, you're often really, you're spending most of your time either digging up bones or describing species from one to a handful of bone fragments. So how accurate is that? Like, how often do you have lots of bone fragments or parts of the skeleton to work with and how often is it like just one or a few bones? It varies a ton. Um, you know, the vast majority of dinosaur fossils, and that's what I know best, are dinosaurs, are very incomplete. Um, and so it does limit like kind of the the amount of information that you can you can get out of them and the reliability of the conclusions you can draw from them. Um, however, especially in recent years, and especially from places like northeastern China, um, we've started to get whole skeletons of dinosaurs, um, sometimes with, with you know, residues of, of feathers or skin or things like mm -hmm. that. And naturally, the more we've got of a fossil animal, the more we can learn about it. So the better our, you know, the, the uh, I often joke that in vertebrate paleontology, um, whoever has the best toys wins. Um, and that's, <laughs> yeah, and that's, um, and, you know, with, this, with the fossils being the toys. And, um, 
and you know i've i've definitely worked on extremely poorly represented fossils before but i've also had the pleasure to work on some really extraordinary fossils too and um, naturally we can say a lot more about the really complete ones than we can about the you know the really fragmentary ones so what would be the minimum number of bones or fragments you would need <laughs> to actually describe something as new um, <laughs> another good question. The, the standard has increased with time. Um, there was a, back in the day, people would name new dinosaur species based on isolated teeth, for instance. Okay. Um, as, you, as you can imagine, um, especially in the case of dinosaurs that where their teeth are relatively homogeneous, relatively, okay. um, they relatively all look the same compared to mammals, for instance. Yeah. Um, you can imagine that this has led to a lot of taxonomic problems, um, you know, mm -hmm. later in history as as, um, as features that were once unique to that quote unquote species have been found to characterize lots of different things. Um, okay. And so it, what, what remains true throughout time is that the species, the fossil species that are named on the best material are most likely to last, you know, to stand the, the test of time. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of a minimum number, um, there really isn't one. Uh, once in a while, somebody will still name, say, a new dinosaur on, uh, on uh, the basis of a single uh, tooth or something like that. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, it's, uh, it, but, you know, the, the, the ideal is much more than that, you know, like a yeah. significant part of a skeleton or okay. a skull or, um, yeah. you know, something that, the, the, the bottom line is it has to show uh, what we call autapomorphies, in other words, unique derived features that nothing else has. And once in a while, you'll find a really bizarre, you know, jaw or, you know, hind limb or something like that, that shows features that nothing else has. And um, at least uh, according to the current state of the art in dinosaur paleontology, you would be justified in naming something based on that. Um, okay. But long story short, the more you have, the better. Okay. So let's see your replica or whatever you have oh, there. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I have my camera off, so you have to tell me if I'm if I've got it in view. Um, yeah. Is that a claw? Can see this. Yeah, this is a claw. Um, this no. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a what? Claw. Is that yeah. life size? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so here's my hand at, at the same uh, size yeah. as this for scale. You can That's see. Um, <laughs> you can see, hopefully, that it's broken off at the tip here, um, and so it would have extended quite a bit further in life, probably something like this. But remember, too, this is just the bony core of the claw, and just like us, you know, just like humans or your cat or whatever it might be, uh, the claw would be covered in keratin, the same stuff your fingernails are made of. So it would have been even longer in life, probably the bony part maybe out to about here. Hopefully you can see that. Um, tell me if you can't. Yeah. And, then, um, yeah. and then maybe like with the keratin, maybe out to here or something like that. So you're talking about an animal that was wielding on its, and this claw goes on the thumb, an animal that was wielding, uh, you know, claws that were probably 15 inches long when this thing was alive. Um, in other words, it could mess you up really that bad. Make the animal? Well, so it's interesting. That's another, that's the next logical question, right? Um, but these, these animals are really interesting because they seem to have outlandishly humongous claws on their, um, the first and second digits, the first and second fingers of, of the hand, the forefoot. Um, so the, the claw, that's, that's the claw that goes on the thumb, what we would call digit one, because we count from the inside to the outside. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the claw on digit two is almost as big. So it, you know, would look like the thing was, you know, running with scissors or something like that, um, with two, two giant blades on its first two fingers. Um, but what's really crazy is these guys, um, uh, these animals have, uh, a, they're three-fingered, not like, you know, T-Rex is famously two-fingered. Um, Megaraptorids are three-fingered. We know that for sure because we have complete hands of megaraptorids. And the third finger actually carries a much smaller claw. So in this animal here, we have the third claw, the claw that goes on the third digit, and it's only about this long. So I don't know if you can tell, but I, you know, um, it, this is roughly maybe three inches long or something like that. So you've got this massive 15 inch claw on the thumb, a claw that's almost as big on the second finger. And then, um, and then this little, you know, kind of rinky dink claw on the third finger. Uh, there's actually some with evidence. How many fingers do you go from the inside out? Yes. Yeah. So okay. thumb is number one, pointer fingers, number two, middle fingers, number three, um, 
Uh, and so in a dinosaur, yeah. of course, because most of them, most predatory dinosaurs have three fingers, it's actually our pointer finger is the, is the middle finger in a dinosaur. Um, but, uh, uh, but if in all vertebrates and all animals, uh, all vertebrate animals, all, all tetrapods, at least you count um, inside to outside. So thumb is one, pointer fingers two, middle fingers three, ring finger four, and pinky five. And are these bipedal or are they quadrupeds? No, these were undoubtedly bipedal for sure. Um, okay. And so um, just to answer your question, which I didn't really answer before, these are big animals, but not giant. You would expect that, um, you know, with a claw like that, if you scale that up from a T-Rex or something, you're looking at a, a meat-eating dinosaur that's probably 70 feet long. But as it turns out, they don't scale that way. They have proportionately giant hands and giant claws. And so uh, the animal to which this claw pertained was likely about maybe 20 to 25 feet long. Um, so big as a predatory dinosaur goes, but not giant. Um, a T-Rex, by comparison, can be 42 feet long. What about um, compared to, so that's, I'm trying to think of like, at that size, I don't have a good, this is going to like show my like, yeah inside I, like what tell it to me in meters and then tell it to me in like relation to ex extant animals sure so in meters it'd be maybe seven to eight meters long and in terms of yeah um but you're talking like again a t-rex can be 12 to 13 meters long so these okay. are gigantic animals um pred yeah. big predatory dinosaurs are um in terms of mass, um, a megaraptor would be bigger than a polar bear for sure. Um, uh, but, but yeah, so these are these are big, formidable animals. But I guess my point is, even as big and formidable as they are, they were not giant as predatory dinosaurs go. There are lots and lots of different kinds that were way bigger. Um, yeah. T-Rex, a group called Carcharodontosaurids um, that were probably the mass of one or two elephants put together. Um, uh, uh, another group called Spinosaurids, which got humongous uh, and have uh, strangely have aquatic adaptations. They seem to have spent a lot of their time in water, which is really cool. Uh -huh.